what's the lowest drag number that's possible? I mean, just how arrow can one person get? We're going to answer those questions today. We're going to define what a drag number actually is and what it means in lay terms. We're going to discuss how all of us can get more arrow. And maybe, just maybe, when all is said and done, we'll get to witness something very special. The most arrow person in the world. Jim from Faster Fiction here. Okay, so today we have an interesting topic. First we have Louie. He would be a video all by himself and I'm fairly certain we'll be seeing more videos dedicated to him in the future. But for now he holds the distinction of being the lowest drag number I've ever recorded of someone on a geared bike. And the number was so good, I didn't believe it. So I made him prove it twice, but more on that in a moment. When we talk about Louis's drag numbers, we'll refer to his drag in terms of CDA, coefficient of drag area. But what is CDA? I mean, most people know the lower the number, the better, but can you define it or describe it to someone who knows nothing about aerodynamics? Here's my dirty little secret. I've been aero testing for well over 20 years. Wind tunnel, I was the first in the world to introduce the Alpha Mana system for velodrome testing, and one of the first to be outdoors with a viable aero sensor that, that measures wind speed and yaw. Athletes I've worked with have won collectively over two dozen elite world titles. All of that, and I actually know very little when it comes to the science of aerodynamics. You see, early on I was pretty overwhelmed by it all. My background in education is biomechanics, not physics. In fact, when it came to aerodynamics, I felt completely lost and out of place. So I was surrounded by all these geniuses who spoke in terms I, I didn't truly understand. It was like a foreign language to me. But that's when I began to understand what my real mission was. My job was to be the translator. I figured out that if I could dumb all this aero stuff down enough so that I could understand it, well then anyone could understand it. So that's what I did, and it's how I brought aero to the masses all those years ago. But let's get back to the question, what is CDA? I mean, I can say it's coefficient of drag area, but what does that mean to you? Let's break it down because it's really two things multiplied together. The CD part of CDA is drag coefficient. It's a value that describes the resistance an object experiences when moving through fluid, in, in our case air. It ignores the physical size of the object and only defines its efficiency moving through air. That's the CD part. The A part is the area, or size of the object. When CD is multiplied with A, we get our drag number. Let me give you this example. Let's say you have two balls. These balls are the exact same shape and made of the exact same material. Because of this, they have the same CD, or drag efficiency. In other words, the efficiency with which air moves over them is the same. The difference, of course, as you can see, is in their size. The larger ball will experience more drag because it's presenting a larger area to the wind. Its frontal area is larger. That's the A part of the equation. Put CD and A together and you can think of it this way. Whenever, wherever you're currently sitting, standing, running, riding, whatever it is you're doing, you have to move air out of your way to be there. It was in that spot before you arrived, and it will reoccupy it once you leave. In the meantime, you both can't be there at once, so you actually remove air from its place by force. You have a bunch of these air molecules just minding their own business, and then you come along and just force them to move. Humans think they own everything. Probably American. The air doesn't want to move, but it has no choice, and in fact, it really doesn't object or resist all that much at all. That is until you want to make it move quickly. Because air, as it turns out, is like a teenager. It doesn't like moving all that fast, and it will put up a fight when you try to make it move more quickly than it wants. The faster you move, the faster the air has to move out of the way, and as the speed increases, so does resistance. Now you can use brute force to move that air if you'd like, but there's a much better, kindler, gentler, more efficient way to do it. In fact, there are two ways to move through air faster with less disruption to the air itself. You can either make air move around you more efficiently by improving 
ACD, drag efficiency, or you can move less air by making what you present to the wind, A, or area, smaller. Aero positioning on a bike is trying to accomplish both things. By placing you in an aero position, we're making you smaller so you present less of yourself to the wind, but we're also helping wind move over you and around you more efficiently. Sometimes you sacrifice one for the other. An aero helmet is actually adding area around your head, but the goal is to lower your CD by helping to airflow around and over your head more efficiently. If the helmet fails to lower CD enough to overcome the area it's added, it can actually raise your drag. We see this all the time with clothing. When, when you put on a kit, it's actually adding area. Small as it may seem, it does make a difference. So unless that kit is helping your CD sufficiently, unless it's helping air flow over and around you more efficiently, you'll actually increase drag. Skin is slow, but wrinkles are worse because they have the potential to significantly add to CD. Does that make sense? Okay, now that we've got all that out of the way, let's talk Louis because he's an excellent example of these principles. Louis CDA is right at 0 0.1600. Yeah, you heard me right. 0.16. For those of you who understand CDA, you know that is an astounding number. And honestly, I refuse to even believe it at first. If you know anything about our testing, you know I make athletes repeat their test runs to ensure we're getting an inaccurate number. In fact, they're forced to get out of their aero position and return back into it several times during the course of a test. And that allows me to make sure that they can repeat those numbers. For instance, there were a couple of runs where Louis dropped into the 0.15s, but because those numbers weren't sustained, we didn't count them. Anyone can put one run together, holding themselves in the perfect position to get a really low number. That happens all the time during aero testing, especially in wind tunnels, but that's not how athletes on any level ride their bikes. It's the sustained drag number that we are after. Sometime in the very near future, I'll put out a video explaining the differences between wind tunnel, velodrome, and outdoor testing. But for both velodrome and outdoor testing, an accurate power meter is key to obtaining good data. When I first saw Louis CDA, and don't get me wrong, I knew it would be low, but when I saw how low it was, I assumed his power meter must be off. So I actually made him come back the next day and use a power meter I provided, which I knew was in good working order and properly calibrated. The result? It was the same. So there it was, uh, the lowest CDA I'd ever recorded on a geared bike, man or woman. I've recorded lower CDAs on, on a track bike, which has no derailleurs, cables, brakes, and it's equipped with double disc wheels. But even then, only once back in 2016 did someone drop below 0.16. Most people are well north of 0.2. In fact, most of the folks watching this are male triathletes, which, hey, by the way, where are the ladies? YouTube says almost 100% of people watching these videos are men. Arrow matters to women just as much as it does to men. So guys, share these videos with the ladies so we can get them faster too. They should be watching these videos with you. Most of you men probably have much higher drag numbers than you realize, and we're just gonna say your average is 0.2500, though honestly, I'm being very generous here. The difference in 0.16 to 0.25 in Louis' case would be over 100 watts. 100, that, that means generally speaking, you have to put out 100 more watts than him just to keep up. In fact, Louis wins a lot of races, but doesn't put out a ton of power. It's just his drag is so low, he doesn't have to. So how did he get such a low CDA? Let's take a look because we can learn a lot about drag from his example. Let's get one thing out of the way. Louis is exceptional when it comes to the A part of CDA, the area part. You see, Louis is five foot one inches tall and weighs around 117 pounds. So yeah, he's small. He, he's got an advantage most of us will never have. He presents very little frontal area to the wind. But it's not just his size. He has an excellent position and has made some great equipment choices, though, as you'll see, some of his equipment isn't exactly what we'd call cutting edge at this point. Let's begin with frontal area. As he rides towards us, you can see how narrow his elbows are, which serves to narrow his shoulders as well. Narrow as arrow, folks. He's punching a very small hole through the wind here. You'll also notice his head is nice and low and his high forearm angle is helping to block the wind from getting to his chest. His helmet is the Giro Arrowhead, which is a great helmet all around. 
This particular version of the Arrowhead is the, is the ultimate, which is non-vented, and is typically more arrow than the, vent, than the vented version of the same helmet. Looking from the side, there are a few interesting things to note. First, he has gone the route of very short reach at 72, uh, 73 degrees of shoulder angle. This doesn't provide a lot of skeletal support of the upper body, but it can help lower an athlete's head. But so does longer reach, and I, th I think we might explore which is better for him in the future. Back angle isn't overly aggressive, nor does it need to be. He's right around 20 degrees here. Of course, his forearm, uh, his forearm angle is noteworthy, right around 30 degrees in a bit of a mantis position. Many of Louis's events don't force him to conform to UCI regulations, so he takes full advantage of that. I think we can make it even better, but we'll discuss that in a moment. His best drag members came when he was wearing his no pins hypersonic skin suit paired with their hypersonic base layer, which is a very interesting design. If you're not familiar with this suit or really the base layer, because it's the base layer that's key, it has raised ribbing or trip strips, which wouldn't seem like a big deal since many suits are made with ribbing. But this is different. You see, the UCI limits the height of ribbing manufacturers can build into the surface of their suits to, I, I believe, one millimeter. The problem is, once you stretch a suit over your body, that one millimeter rib is, is sort of stretched and, and compresses, so it's not as effective. No pins geniusly found a way around that rule. Their trip strips are not on the surface of their skin suit. They're below on the base layer. But the surface of the hypersonic skin suit, which is quite smooth and doesn't have ribbing or trip strips, is raised up by the base layer strips underneath, creating a greater uh, effect than traditional ribbing. I had the chance to test this several times now, and, it, and I can confirm it works. In fact, our data agrees with the data No Pins provides on their website, which I've linked to below. What I also want to point out is how tight this suit fits him. I mean, just look at him trying to get this thing on. Time trial skin suit should fit very tightly to provide the best benefit to the athlete. You see here, he actually needs assistance getting the suit on it so tight. Skin is slow, but wrinkles are worse, remember? So the better the fit, the less wrinkles you're going to have. Louis also uses the no pins hypersonic overshoes, and, and these also helped him lower his drag. I'm, I'm purposely refraining from giving specific gains for each piece because these are Louis's results and his data to share as he wishes. Though we're going to have some fun with this in, in the very near future, and we'll likely detail everything then. So don't worry, we are gonna get into individual gains. But let's look at the bike because it's kind of interesting. Well, it's interesting because it's not interesting, and let me explain that. First, the frame. Uh, it's an Orbea Ordu. A great bike for sure, but not exactly the latest and greatest tech when it comes to bike design. It sort of speaks to the fact that we're close, if not right at peak aero when it comes to frame design. His aero bar is also showing its age. It's a head base bar with clip-on extensions. Perfectly fine, but as you can see, a bit old school compared to today's designs that, that hide all the cables and wires away. Potential to lower some drag there? Maybe. His front wheel too is a bit long in the tooth. This Reynolds wheel is certainly good, but perhaps some of the newer designs out there might help us uh, to lower his drag number a little more. I don't know. Front and rear rim brakes are tri-rig Omegas, and well, those are about as good as it gets, so there's no reason to change uh, those at all. The rear wheel is a dash, di uh, dash disc, which I have no comparison data on, but discs are generally a very good thing, obviously, for the back of the bike. But as you can see here, there's really nothing of note that just grabs your attention. It's a setup that's kind of showing its age for sure, but it's showing well enough. My question though is, can we make it better? If we were to make some changes, how low can we get Louis's drag number? Can we get him solidly in the 0.15s or could we go below 0.15? I'm not sure to be honest, but considering possible upgrades to both his position and equipment that we can make, I think it's possible. So we're going to try. We're calling it the 1-4 project and in the coming weeks and months we'll be making changes to Louis's position and equipment to find out just how low his drag number can go and we're going to detail them all right here on Faster Fiction. In the meantime, though, what would you change for Louis if it was your job to make him faster? Do you think it's possible to get him below 0.15? Leave a comment below and we'll try some of the best recommendations that uh, you guys have. Okay, so there you go. One quick correction from last week's video on Walt Van Art and the new Cervelo P5. 
I incorrectly stated that 100 centi 180 centimeters was right around five foot nine inches when in fact it's just over five foot 10 inches. That's my bad. But I really appreciate those of you who caught the error and I'm not joking. I, I, you know, there's a lot of information I have to give sometimes and, and uh, mistakes can be made. So I really do appreciate people catching the mistakes I make. I hope you enjoyed this video. If so, please give us a thumbs up. If you want to smash the thumbs down button, hey, feel free to do that too. I'm not going to be offended by it. But if you're not subscribed, consider doing so. The next video will be the top 10 things you can do to get more aero. And then the week after we have the test of the specialized TT5 aero helmet. We're going to test multiple athletes to see if it truly is fast or if it's fiction. Until then, I hope you enjoyed it. Don't be a drag, get aero, and we'll see you next week.